Bonjour et bienvenue à Imagination. Aujourd'hui, on a le plaisir d'accueillir l'équipe de Firebird. Bienvenue à Imagination. I'm Kat Setzer, Director of Programming, and it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator this afternoon, Michael Belcher. He is a Montreal-based writer, teacher, playwright, and importantly for us, he is the master wordsmith behind our synopses each year for I'm thinking like six years I was trying to count but not sure quite a while and so our beautiful words are very much thanks to him so Michael please take it away yes so uh first off it's it's uh it's nice to meet you and congratulations on uh what seems to be a highly acclaimed film uh I've heard lots of uh, great stuff from people who've uh, watched it it's also very beautifully atmospheric um, and so I wanted to start off just with uh, kind of the, the outset, the, um, the source material. Uh, so the film is based on um, Sergei Fedezov's memoir, The Story of Roman. And I know that both of you had a chance to speak with him in person before he passed away. And I was wondering what drew you originally to, uh, to his story? Well, originally the story actually reached me uh, through Berlinale Film Festival when Sergei's uh, best friend, the Russian film critic, was showing his memoir around to people. And a friend of mine brought it to me to read and I, I read it in my very broken Russian over a weekend at home. Uh, literally cried and just felt that this needs to be told to the world and turned into a film. And, uh, and then started writing for the first time ever, uh, never having written a script before. And then a uh, couple of years later, when I thought that this masterpiece is ready, uh, then uh, was introduced to Tom by a mutual friend, a film producer from Los Angeles. And, uh, and then with the intention of Tom playing the lead of uh, Sergei. And we uh, actually shot two scenes as a proof of concept for financiers. Uh, that was 2015 summer, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then Tom started making some comments. <clears throat> yeah, I I just like uh, jumped in a little bit when we were doing even the rehearsals, for the the teaser, just to you know say could we try switching around some of the dialogues to make them sound a little more like uh, you know realistic or or kind of natural to kind of come out. I mean, one of the hardest things really about screenwriting or, or any kind of writing really at the end of the day is actually making dialogue particularly sound believable, and actually the way that people speak or actually not even what they say, but actually sometimes what they don't say. And um, yeah, then Peter graciously took like then a few more weeks worth of my feedback about the overall sort of structure and, and story. And then that led to us literally rewriting the whole film for the next two and a half years. And what do you feel like each of you brought to it, each of your perspectives, like how do you kind of conceive of your individual perspective? This I want to hear actually. <laughs> um, well, I think I brought the, uh, the experience of growing up as a uh, closeted gay boy in Soviet occupied Estonia and and it was a very personal story for me from the point of view that even our summer cottage was just a few miles from that air force base okay. and little did I know at the time what was going on there but I, I do remember the jets and uh, and you know passing low overhead so you literally fall off your bike as a kid so that was I think one bit and and probably also the structural uh, bit whereas Tom I think brought to the story this very deep presence in the moment uh, of really thinking in the moment in dialogues and situations of how uh, how to make the film and the script really as as truthful as it is today I think like one of the <clears throat> things that's been kind of interesting to hear, especially when we premiered the film in Estonia, was that people were like, oh, this is not like a very Estonian film. And I was like, well, no, because you dragged in a British writer. And so like, you know, it ended up, ended up kind of like becoming a very sort of different thing. I mean, I've, I've grown up, you know, watching James Bond and Jason Bourne and, and reading Tintin and, and sort of, you know, thrillers and, and all of that. So I really wanted to bring in that element to this story. Mm. Um, because in the original story, actually, you know, the 
the relationship is portrayed in such a way which is almost like fantastical it's like incredible like you're like how on earth did this relationship exist and there's moments in the story where you go like surely this didn't happen because it almost seems like it was almost too easy at points and so a lot of the a lot of the kind of adaptation which we ended up doing like when i jumped in was really about making it more into this kind of thriller and you know putting in like the axes and sequences and putting in this sort of like metal and, and machinery so that we we actually also believe uh, and see a working air force base rather than it being like an aesthetic which we can kind of look at but never really touch mm -hmm. yeah um just because you said something interesting about what would you say is a typical estonian film like that it wouldn't have these kind of big thriller aspects <laughs> or like what do you what do you mean I mean, like very slow and very like uh, everything happens inside the head, right? Mm. Yeah, it would have been much more of a sulky story, <laughs> honestly. It would yeah. have been much more like kind of heavy and nostalgic and, and sort of slow moving and and yeah, I actually uh, uh, think it's it's a good combination. Even though I still miss a couple of those, like I call them poetic moments mm. uh, that we cut out at the end, but. Uh, let's say could have uh could have tiny bit even more of those moments um mm. but it's it's uh yeah it's definitely a much more fast paced film than a typical estonian film yeah and i'm gonna i'm gonna mention the poem uh, that you start with in a moment but uh and uh you also have like a shakespeare line there as well but I, um in terms of the source material um uh to continue is that what so what drew you is that this connection obviously it's a very entertaining story is there anything about sergey himself that originally drew you to the to the material him as a persona yeah i mean one of the sort of main decisions which we decided to do and actually for, for me specifically as an actor as well is when we when we met um sergey in moscow he was a very um he was a very like kind of s sort of sunny um like very like whole and very positive person and so really once once like you know sergey in the movie gets like unlocked per se by by roman i kind of decided you know let's play him like that you know there was there's lots of opportunities that there could have been you know to start dealing with things like shame or dealing with you know that internal frustration which we've seen a lot in cinema and you know we were like creatively let's also just have somebody who's not necessarily operating out of fear but actually more out of out of courage and out of um um this kind of like endless hope even which Sergei has at these pointing moments in the film um you know that's what he was like when, when we went to Moscow to meet him he you know, was openly flirting with a male waiter at a, at a restaurant in a suburb of Moscow. And we were like, <laughs> what the hell is going on here? And like, it was, it was, and it was, you know, it was also in a very endearing way. It wasn't sort of like sleazy or anything like that. It was just so, he was so sort of full of heart. So that's really, that really informed like, you know, a decision particularly around the playing of it. But I think also that heavily influenced the writing. Mm. Um, so one last question about the the source material. It's like a two parter. Um, what interesting fact about him that maybe you left out of the film, maybe for a specific reason? And then on the other side, what is your favorite kind of uh, aspect of the memoir that you added? I think we left out the threesome in the lake, right? <laughs> yeah, there was actually a threesome in the lake, which which. You know, to a degree, like we kind of wanted to kind of, I mean, like when we were writing like the intimate scenes, for example, like I, I'm a great believer in like, you know, also creating originality, like what, what's something that we haven't seen before. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's really why we kind of went after that kind of particular setup of, a, of their first physical encounter. Um, but yeah, we, de we definitely left that out. But it, it was kind of amazing to discover um you know something that kind of has made its way into the film a lot is as you mentioned earlier is shakespeare and you know one of the interesting things we found out about sergey when we met him was that he learned every single shakespeare sonnet before he even went to drama school um because he was so passionate about shakespeare and um you know shakespeare themes heavily at, at the beginning of 
almost every chapter of the original story as well. There's Shakespeare mm -hmm. quotes and there's a few other poetic quotes by a whole kind of combination of different poets as well. But like Shakespeare was a, a heavy influence actually that we we were really surprised about um, to actually discover. And it wasn't just the British guy coming in and saying we should put Shakespeare in the Soviet Union. Yeah. But actually, like it was kind of mad to discover that in like 1963 there were like more than 300 different productions of Shakespeare going on in the Soviet Union. Uh -huh. And there is that to the sonnets. There is that queer undercurrent of like uh, what lovers being spoken to. So maybe kind of already before that was yeah, even yeah. talked about understanding that. Yeah. Um, so it's uncommon that I mean it does happen. Imitation game has done it, but it's it's quite uncommon that. Um, uh, a gay love story would be told within this kind of sweeping context of war. In this case, it's the Cold War. So what attracted you to telling this specific genre of story, the war story? Like what what did that help bring um, to the, uh, I don't know, to your acting, but also your directing? Uh, what did it add? I think it, because it's the true story. So we, we wanted to stay, um, actually, one thing which I want to add, which I'm really sad about, that we actually cut out from the script and from the original story the whole relationship with Sergei's mother, mm -hmm. uh, which we had a whole uh, whole bit where he goes back uh, to home both after the military service and after the New Year's Eve, and it just felt that it was not moving the the main storyline ahead, but it, it was. It was such sad because mother was the most important person uh, in his life, really. Yeah. I think before Roman even, we felt that. But but for the sake of uh, making a film that that doesn't drag, but I, I think the setting um, it's it's really about staying true uh, to the original story, and I think the uniqueness of the story is really the fact that it took place in the Soviet Union. Uh, at the height of the Cold War. Um, if we put it in modern context, uh, there have been a lot of forbidden love stories told, but uh, but really nothing uh, from that time and place that we know of. Mm. Yeah, it was like, it was so fascinating to, you know, have the story, you know, come come to me, you know, it, kind of full circle after Peter started writing <clears throat> and just go on like, well, this is a really curious relationship, but in a, in a, in a background that I love, like I've always like been fascinated by the Soviet Union and you know that period of history and time and and you know the I mean we were lucky enough to but not deliberately it was just the case that she was when we were going to meet Sergei but you know the Victory Day parade was on in in Moscow which you know is so iconic with all these like thousands of soldiers and tanks and missiles and plane flyovers and everything it's just like you know they do that so well there it's like it's so it's such a great you know show such a great performance and i think that that serves so well to you know the excitement of a, of a film and cinematic experience yeah because it really is a it's a, a spectacle in a way that uh often we don't necessarily get in queer storytelling as much because usually they war movies uh, require such a a huge budget, lots of kind of resources. You have to have lots of extras playing all of the uh, the military. Um, so how were you able to create, uh, so this is probably for, more for, for you, Peter, but how were you able to create these kind of thrilling action sequences that, I mean, I was kind of uh, so surprised and delighted by uh, within any constraints that you faced? Mm, through hell. <laughs> I mean, actually, honestly, for me, that was the most challenging part because I don't see myself really as an action director. So it was challenging to actually make that happen and work with a VFX company and, uh, and you know, work with a very small budget. But, you know, you can use uh, a sewage pipe instead of, like, things. And you can sort of a stinger missile. Yeah, yeah, it's literally like a drain pipe and things like that. So, <laughs> so it's... It's about being very, I think, creative and having an amazing production team who are able to do things, uh, you know, without spending huge amounts of money. Because obviously in Hollywood, this would probably be like four or five times bigger budget to do this kind of a film, at least, if not more. Um, but it, it's also planning. Um, we visited the locations uh, three times at least with our DOP. 
and really thought through the camera angles and what we can use. So the film is shot in Estonia, in Moscow and in Malta. And I think in Estonia alone, we have 46 locations. Mm. So we would use the actual little pieces of remaining Soviet uh, army kind of uh, heritage. Like we could find this couple of hangars at one airfield and fix them up and paint them up. And we could find this uh, uh, old barracks where the barrack scenes are shot and fix it up and kind of some few remaining buildings that hadn't been demolished yet and use them as real sets, as real real settings where the Soviet army actually operated. Wow. Yeah, there's something so amazing about using real sets. Like I was shooting a film recently in, in uh, Malta <clears throat> they managed to get access to all kinds of incredible different sets there that you know are, are real and authentic they're not sort of built and i think that that just sort of like invariably creates like so much more that kind of bleeds through the screen that feels authentic so the the barracks for example which peter mentioned um when margus who plays uh the kgb major walked was gonna bring him up. Set, yeah. he uh he looked at this room and was like, this is really spooky because he goes, I literally stayed as a conscript in this room. Oh, wow. I mean, the building has now been since been demolished because it was so unsafe, but it was it was actually 100 percent authentic. Oh, wow. And uh, speaking of this uh, character played by Margus, uh, so, I mean, every good kind of war story thriller that's uh, I mean, obviously that's not the only element, there's uh, a lot of others, but the thriller element kind of requires a villain in some way. Um, and so did you have to, to stray very far from the source material to find this specific character? Was he like a conflation of various people or did he kind of represent a general, um, a general villainy in the, in the culture or in the army? It was both. Uh, there was um, there was a character in the original story, but we definitely added uh, to make the threat more uh, visible. And I think there was a prototype at another base in Estonia, actually the one where we shot the hangar scenes, uh, who had the same name also, who was actually Zverev, mm. uh, which means like, uh, what's the connotation in Russian? It's like angry or not really angry but you know somebody who is like uh wants to get you <laughs> mm. uh, but yeah it, we definitely uh, changed his character to uh i think to bring that threat uh to the audience yeah and like to a degree you know it's it's kind of like in these moments where like the kind of paranoia of the the system kind of comes through and it, you can do it actually in quite a simple way but it was a bit like this moment where like you see this uh these uh guys with headphones on this affiliators and they're like recording conversations and stuff and mm. it's just like moments like that which in the script it's it's like three lines but like what it does psychologically as you experience the film is it creates this awareness and understanding and so then every time we hear this like <laughs> at the door you know, when we watch it with a live audience, like with a, with a responsive audience, people are like, oh, like, <laughs> not again. Yeah. And, um, and it, you know, it, it really works, actually, that it becomes this thing, almost like it was in the Soviet Union. You're like, you don't know what that knock on the door actually means mm. if you're not expecting somebody. Yeah. And I've been, like, really amazed the scene where Zverev kind of appears at the rainy window. Um, and usually uh, the audience is really reacted. I was like quite surprised the first few times that it's like that strong uh, reaction to that image, um, which is cool. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting German film uh, done a few years ago in one take, I think it was called Hammer. And they have like an encounter on a street with two thugs. <coughs> as, oh, know, no, Victoria. Oh, Victoria, yeah, sorry. Uh, and it's so so it's amazing to observe how this little like 15 20 second encounter in the beginning of the film sets up the threat for the whole film and yeah, you don't yeah. really even need more you're immediately like feeling unsafe the whole film and you get the environment that you could be attacked at any moment mm. 
So I think that the biggest challenge for us as writers with Tom was to find that balance. Uh, if you have too little, it's like a nice holiday in an army base. And if you have too much, it becomes kind of cliche and like over the top. So yeah, some, I mean, that's the best that we could figure out. So. Well, no, I think you did a great balance because uh, sometimes they get a, 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 in films where they push it too much. It feels like, well, can we not have the like, the moment to appreciate the person's love without thinking at any moment it could be ruined. And I thought they created a good, great balance of that so that you really got to sit with some of those more lovely moments between them and, uh, and see their relationship kind of on its own without necessarily always being uh, watched. So uh, at least this viewer, I <laughs> really liked that. Um, also become almost like comical as well if you, you know like we've always seen the army films where there's the sergeant who is you know doing the stuff and you know to try and figure out that particular scene mm -hmm. as well you know we was rewriting and rewriting and rewriting just go because otherwise it becomes either like borderline like yeah, ridiculous yeah. or yeah. funny and like just doesn't do the job of actually going like eek like actually like this is actually really like doesn't feel like pleasant Mm. Yeah, and you almost even like, yeah, and he's like right on the line where you do feel you actually kind of understand what he thinks his role is too. Like, uh, yeah, and so it's interesting that you see both sides. Uh, and speaking of kind of this complexity you bring to potentially uh, flat characters, there's a third main character, the the part of the love triangle, Louisa. Um, and often in films that center on, on gay men, the female character who sort of comes between can sometimes seem not, uh, not fully fleshed out, but I really felt that she was. Was that important for you to, to have that third character, this female character, be three-dimensional? Yeah, totally. I mean, like, uh, as you said, it was actually as regards to having seen so many films that go like, Hooray, like the same same sex relationship gets through and and yeah. what about the trail of destruction that they left behind them and, and every, all the broken hearts and all the you know betrayal and um you know in the original story louisa like was actually portrayed as like a formidable drunk basically mm -hmm. and uh that's actually one of the biggest changes that we made actually from the original story is that we really wanted to give a very honest um and sincere voice to to Louisa because you know her tragedy is is as big mm. um you know she like they can't tell her like she like she you know like the the moment like where you know there's, there's this discussion of like the wedding and Sergei is like you know like nobody can say anything to each other about what's going on like in reality mm. and so yeah it, it was really important for us to to give her that moment to go like you know what about me and 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 also like the tragedy of their friendship mm. and how like that is really in tatters by the end of the film yeah yeah the real sergey yeah when we had the amazing possibility to interview him for several days in moscow uh, when we asked about luisa you could feel that he had a very strong uh strong kind of uh, negative feelings mm and probably might have even blamed her for everything and uh, we just felt that that's probably a very personal perspective and uh, and in real life uh, there's really there is really no right and wrong uh, they couldn't tell her and uh, and she didn't willingly choose such a family and relationship yeah and part of the what you were talking about Tom with this idea that she, things are left unsaid. I find that um, photography is used as a, a truth telling mechanism within the story. Um, and so do you feel like, what can photography reveal that maybe words can't? Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, what a good question. Um, it's because it's it's a device which actually helps you communicate so much without having to say something that can be so on the nose. I mean, how do you insinuate that your lead character is kind of attracted to guys predominantly at the beginning of a story? And you go, well, you can't like you either say it 
or you show it somehow. And, you know, we've all seen the like the awkward moments of getting hard in the shower or whatever. And it's just like, again, it's like we've already seen this. Mm. It was like, what's a way of doing that? And so, you know, there's this curiosity. He has this curiosity about how how to capture people anyway in uh, with, with photos, with photography. And so, you know, this moment at the beginning where he he's you know taking a picture of the girl and then moves to the guy and then the close-up and the detailing mm -hmm. that again was sort of like inspired by when we were creating it like um by like for me anyway it was was by a single man like the tom ford movie mm -hmm. just these moments which seem almost bigger than life or like they seem so rich or so vibrant or colorful that it, it it's so it's informing us without having to you know exposition or or without having to sort of like explain or have something really on the nose mm. and i think that you know that's that's actually really one of the best the best most frustrating but best things we did about our very long writing process is that we just managed to pull out and get out of our system like all of these pitfalls which could have been really like cliche really like done before and and so yeah i think i think we managed to Mm. I should pull out a majority of them but yeah obviously photos are telling a story all the way through with 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 Roman and and his his like perception of Sergei as uh, with the camera focus and and then like sort of later on you know with with Louisa and discovering and, and sort of what does that mean mm. it also kind of shows the nature of Sergei's character in terms of uh being interested in the beauty of life and kind of observing especially in the beginning of the film more observing than participating in a mm -hmm. way which i always found like fascinating uh, the change yeah and there's like a, i mean i might be remembering this one, but there's like a uh, he has like a uh, close-up of flowers and then it moves to lips and i like that they're kind of like there's these connections that shows that he's also kind of good with this medium as well. Like he kind of sees these these links between things in the world. Um, in addition to like truth, so truth is on this kind of one side, what is truth? And then there's uh, Sergei's, what's called quote unquote, his fantasy world. Um, and this fantasy world becomes a point of contention between Sergei and Roma. Um, it's kind of thrown at Sergei at, at one point. Um, and Sergei, Hopefully, I don't think this is giving too much away, but Sergei, I mean, it gets connected with the the theater world in, in Moscow, and it's described as like another world. Um, so what are the positives and negatives of this fantasy world for this relationship between Sergei and Roman? What uh, What is good about it and what is bad about it from both of their perspectives, do you think? Do you want to watch the first slide? Sure, to go. I'll begin. Um, so is so his fantasy world, uh, or like his kind of. I mean, I guess like the, the, it's it's the quality which we took from meeting him in real life. Was this there is you know meeting him in real life? Were these moments of going like, are you delusional or are you just like, you actually just choosing to see the best in in the situation? Mm -hmm. You know, again, without sort of putting in spoilers, but there's, you know, the moment, um, the the the, uh, the wedding moment, you know, he's he's still in there. Like, he's still kind of going, like, come on, like, this can all still work out. Work out. And, you know, it's that kind of relentlessness which could be, you know, perceived to be delusional or actually just go like, well, I'm just not letting things get in the way um and you know the, there's this dream which he has um which is obviously about his his past as well which kind of holds him into some degree of um fear and trauma but it's also like the link with that which which is again like another element which is unlocked into him going to follow his dreams again and there's the liberation of that by you know him exposing the story later on and and um i don't really know if this is answering the question no it was great yeah, no that's, uh, that's interesting <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 
And I like the, the, the know the connection between him and uh, the real life one. Yeah. Peter, were you going to say something? No, I think you already like said it. Well, okay. So. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> um, the uh, so you, you had mentioned the kind of the poetic aspects. Uh, I mean, the, the Shakespeare aspects. So the the film opens with, I guess I would call it a poem. I don't know if it's a quote a poem, um, but the idea that uh, it says, "quote Black thorns and roses, smiles and tears, they're sewn together and grow so near." So how do you see this sentiment playing out within this love triangle? Like, how does this sentiment of both the good and the bad, the kind of push and pull work with these three people? Well, it's life, I guess, that everything um, contains the two opposites, the, uh, let's yeah. say, in quotation marks, good and the bad, even though, mm. as we know from Shakespeare, already, there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Uh, but it's it's kind of, it's kind of an amazing summary of the whole story, and uh, that's the quote which uh, Sergei started his book with. And we felt that it's it's really important to start the film. It only happened in post production. In the script phase, we actually didn't have this quote there. Only when we cut the film together, we felt okay, it needs something here in the beginning to give it this tone. And we actually started like experimenting with uh, also quotes in the other parts, but then just stayed with this opening one quote. And um, I think it's it's life, and the whole film is really about about universality of love, and uh, and we as human beings with our thoughts we overcomplicate everything and charge others, and you know there is. If, if we just let everybody live their life, there wouldn't be any uh, need for constant thorns among the roses, right, and tears. That, uh, it's, um, I, think, I think overall the story is really, um, for me at least, a, a lot about how our societies and uh, conditioning and how this kind of judgments by others by authoritarian systems destroy people's lives and love mm. um, but maybe tom has some uh, cool other angle <laughs> i think i think you know that it's a bit sort of like this this shakespeare line from romeo and juliet which is you know loving hate mm. um you know shakespeare's used like so many of these like hyperboles together for forever which works so well because they are so so near to each other you know one day you're in a relationship with the person you love the most and then they betray you and then you hate them more than anything mm. and that's just so true you know in so many moments in life as as hell painful as it can be um you know as we learn and grow then hopefully we can become a little bit more considerate in how we behave towards those people that we love dearly but um, I think, like, for me, the, the thing actually that ended up, again, it, it was kind of amazing in, in post-production to find this, this particular one, and we because we were playing around with quite a few different quotes and then settled on this, and then it just felt like a really nice top and tail to the, to the movie because we end with this, this uh, with the tears as well, like, right at the end. And so mm -hmm. I think that that kind of brings us in this sort of full circle without it being like an opening and a closing image which is kind of together it's more like it's in the words and then it's in the image oh, wow. like post-realization we never like discussed it from that point of view right no. it's mm. more like coming seeing it come together which is interesting you can like analyze a work and bring a lot of intellectual to it but in reality it's all about feeling and i think that was for me at least the biggest learning exercise doing my first feature uh, to trust intuition and feeling and not anything else no opinions no logical thinking but uh, if a scene or a moment feels true or if it feels right then that's that's all that matters really i think as yeah. writing and directing and do you feel like you honed that with your previous work i mean because like concert films music videos those all require such dexterity and capturing like the perfect kind of connection like do you feel like your previous work helped you navigate that with your first feature 
Absolutely. I think everything prepares. And I, I think if I uh, tried to direct this straight out of college, it would have been a totally different film, mm. um, life experience in general. But I think uh, if you look at the short form versus a feature, it's such a different animal. Um, it's like running 100 meters versus running the full marathon. Mm. And uh, the rhythm, the, uh, the kind of overall architecture or structure of the film is so different from a three five or even ten minute piece and uh, i think the challenge is also of uh, you know shooting for 55 days and preparing for half a year and almost burning out and then going straight into editing so uh, it's it's a pretty uh, pretty wild experience and then our editor actually had to go on to another 10-part TV series and we was oh, some ended up like taking a whole summer to finish uh, and kind of send him things to review and approve. So it was yeah, very hands-on uh, filmmaking. Mm. Um, just to ask like a, a question kind of along the same lines of like the kind of personal backstory. So I know that like Tom, like healthy, healthy living is important to you or at least it seems so kind of like in your in your social media presence. How do you feel like uh, fitness, uh, good eating? Like, how do you feel like that connects to your approach to acting? I and mean, obviously, we see the fruits of the labor on screen physically, but do you feel like it also helps you kind of uh, attack acting as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I'm sitting here right now with my leg up, like on the desk, because I've managed to give myself a slight injury from right. running. Which was not deliberate at all. It's actually honestly quite baffling what how it happened. But but um, I it, it's it's fundamentally important because particularly because when you're dealing with very complex emotions, um, your body is producing these chemicals which you wouldn't be experiencing if you are experiencing them in real life. Mm. So when you start you know experiencing emotions like grief and you know, betrayal and, uh, you know, like basically, let's say degenerative emotions, it can begin to take a bit of a, a toll on your body. Um, if you're doing it obviously for a sustained amount of time, that's why like for me, honestly, I don't have a huge amount of interest to play a very depressing uh, or, or, or very sort of psychotic character only because I don't really want to sort of like ingrain that into my system. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, our, our bodies are immensely intelligent, more intelligent than we could possibly imagine. And so if we treat it with respect and, and with love and with, with, you know, regenerative attitude, then um, it will serve us. You know, it, it's our vehicle to experience this amazing reality. And if we take care of it, then, it's you know for the most part touch wood like pain free and um you know malleable and can make us experience everything from from taste to physical experiences to you know working with our voice or whatever it might be so yeah i mean like how we think and and how we feel really does create like our our life and mm -hmm. I'm like fascinated by by the whole thing, and I'm also fascinated by human human potential, or I could even say superhuman potential, and and that's something I really want to actually write about in in futures and films cool. is really exploring what we're actually capable of doing. Um, mm. So yeah, it's it's just so important, like as an actor, to be to be ready, to be well, to know what protocol to go into. Like I mean, shooting fifty four days, like in a row and i actually didn't have a day off like normally you know like a, as the lead actor you may get like a few days off but i literally didn't have a day off i had like maybe one afternoon i think where i got wow. home a few hours early but i was like if i get sick like the whole production grinds to a halt and you know <coughs> when we have like a, a a shooting location which is only available for that day and and it's cost x amount of money and everybody's there <coughs> there's you know nothing there's nothing you can do like uh, and so it's, it's kind of like that that pre-investment of looking after yourself you know we, we our first day of shooting was 11 hours or my, personally 11 hours in the sea 
um, in the Baltic Sea at, at about 12 degrees. Yeah. And I, you know, that's like people would go like, oh, you should just expect to get ill. And I was just like, no, like that's just not even, that's just not even like in, you know, in, in my kind of possible outcomes. So, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> um, the, uh, the title um, of the whole uh, film, like the Firebird title, I mean, I, I it has multiple meanings. Um, there's kind of like the, there's a military connotation, but there's also the connotations of the, the Stravinsky ballet that uh, is uh, takes part in the film or, or is part of the film. Um, what did you want that title to encapsulate? Like, did you want it to encapsulate the kind of mix between action and heart or like why, why did you <laughs> that particular title? It was about feeling again. We um, were searching for the title, and honestly, the for me, I think the main motivation was the music. Mm. Just this firebird suite with which we end, and uh, you know, the last shot of the film. Actually, that's funny because the last shot of the film, I read a critique recently, and somebody was like, "Oh, and they like copied cheaply a portrait of a lady on fire." And I was mm. laughing that you know we. It was in the script in 2011, and we shot it way before Portrait came out. So, you know, sometimes people just come up with a very similar idea at the same time. And critics uh, should probably like research a bit before <laughs> the shooting dates and etc. Uh, but, but that's that was, I think, for me, the inspiration that this music and the connection of Sergei's change to follow his dreams is really caused by. The Firebird Ballet, and, and it has this kind of pivotal role. Yeah, no, I mean, I love that moment. I've seen both films, and I didn't. Yeah, I think they do different things with that. So I was, uh, uh, I love the idea of the the power of music. Um, the mechanical mechanical shot is similar, but exactly the feeling is totally different in the last yeah, two shots. So for sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so just a, a few more questions. Is that um, so on? Um, uh, Instagram, Tom, I saw that you had written that uh, you had said that one of my favorite lines to write in the script was, quote, I know now that our love can only exist where there is no thought and no time. And can you just talk a bit about why that line has such uh, resonance with you? Oh, gives me like chills, like thinking about it. Now, I remember actually exactly like where we were in the writing process when we were like coming up with with this and I was reading something or I was listening to a song or something which which kind of really like had this sort of like feeling in that um, it's like, it's kind of a bit like when somebody dies, you know, you can say that they're always with you. It obviously really depends upon your belief of, of death and separation and things like that. But, you know, it it's kind of like outside of all of this chaos and all of this noise and all of these restrictions, like there is the unified field of, of, of love. And that basically does go beyond space and time. Um, you know, even Christopher Nolan's put that in Interstellar. And, um, you know, I was really, I actually watched that back recently and was really sort of pleasantly surprised to have kind of had quite a few years of, of separation from that film and come back to it. And I was like, actually, it's quite profound that, you know, it, it like true love really can go beyond space and time. And so when Sergei says that, he's just like going like, you know, I will, I will always love you, but it, it can't exist right now in, in this time space reality. Mm. And, um, and um, yeah, I mean, our, our music composer actually did an amazing thing, which she didn't even tell us about. And when we were recording the live music um, in Prague, uh, I went and sat in the, the Rudolfian Theatre where we were, we were recording it. And we were like, okay, we're going to move on to another section now. And I was like, what the hell is this music? I was just like, this is not on our... This is not in the score anywhere. I was like, what's this piece? And I just began listening and letting it affect me. And like, I was just a mess emotionally. And um, I said to Christoph afterwards, I was like, what is this? 
And he was like, oh, well, you know, I just sort of did a few extra pieces and just told the orchestra to play it. So we've got it recorded just in case. And I said to him afterwards, I was just like, I really want you to call that if Roman had lived. Mm, wow. And it's such a profound piece of music that we still didn't quite know what to do with it. But it's kind of a bit like the same thing that we can experience with with love, with music, with with these things which are kind of like operating. I don't want to say like a higher level, but at, at a level which is which is really meaningful, which escapes all barriers, all all limitations. And I think really for me, that's like what that that line was about when we put it in. You know, mm -hmm. just to say to somebody like I will always love you, regardless of how crazy the situation goes. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is that your film kind of proves that. I mean, his their, their love has now gone on to a different generation. More people will know about it. So there's like an echo outwards uh, from there. Um, the I mean, there's a background that you have, Peter, uh, um, in the fact that you've played a activist role, especially in Estonia. Um, did that how did that inform how you wanted to tell this story? Did it, or, I mean, you have Russia and Estonia as these kind of central places. Was it important to you to kind of get those uh, places right, or how did that uh, affect you? Well, historically, it was very important to make this film as truthful to each detail as possible. And I think, uh, again, the crew did a really cool job there. In terms of activism, yep, I, I was definitely one of the kind of small group of people who lobbied for the equal partnership law, which we actually managed to pass in Estonia already, I think, is it now eight years ago? Um, which, which was important. And, uh, and I think, you know, telling this kind of a story uh, obviously is important because things are not very well in many countries. I mean, our experience with this film in Russia is an amazing case. Uh, we actually were invited to the Moscow International Film Festival in April, which we were amazed because it's the biggest festival of Russia. Nikita Mihalkov is the resident. And there were only two LGBT titles out of the 147. And we thought that actually things in Russia have changed. But then uh, after our first screening, there was a letter written to the state prosecutor asking to ban the film the Russian film was actually taken off the program immediately. They never got to even play. And uh, there were people demonstrating with uh, banners in front of our cinema, uh, you know, stop homosexual propaganda. Literally, the festival was under so much pressure that they cancelled all sales, they cancelled all uh, press and uh, VIP tickets and played the movie to an empty hall. And last week, we were actually the opening film at the side-by-side -side LGBT film festival in St. Petersburg. And, uh, you know, during our live Q&A, they had to shut down their YouTube channel because uh, homophobic bots were attacking it. And yesterday, actually, their website, festival website, was shut down by Russian authorities investigating, you know, in quotation marks, a claim of indecency. So it's 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 sad and it's like just deepeningly sad what the community still has to undergo in in many countries including russia and i think for that reason it's very important to tell their stories and uh, i feel kind of part of or very close to the community uh, but from the other hand uh, we did not want to make in any way political film um, i think our focus was only 100 percent on the true love story and and real sergey when we met him also in moscow had just one wish and that wish was please make this film about love not politics and that's amazing yeah um yeah it is it's i love that we're able to kind of appreciate your film and like where i live in the world and in this context so i really appreciate uh having this film in the uh in the festival um Lassie, unless there's uh, other questions that they're going to put in the chat, uh, I wanted just to finish up with just seeing like what's um, uh, what's next for you. Are you working on something now? I know you you mentioned uh, Malta, Tom, but uh, what is coming out for you, or what are you uh, tackling next? Mm, for me personally, there's like several things that I really want to write, uh, like future projects. I mean, we have between the two of us as well, like several projects which we're 
considering like creating together as well like moving forward <clears throat> it's really like getting the film out to the world right now as well like as in literally getting this film distributed and, and, and we're doing that ourselves um that's certainly no small undertaking um but yeah really with regards to to future like for me personally like i really want to continue to to play you know significant meaningful roles um in in future films um and then also continue to make films that in such a way and you know exploring things like uh, our sort of human potential and 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 sort of like it, again and in this sort of like in in a kind of a, i guess like a spectrum of genres as well and for you peter I think at the moment the only goal is uh, launching this film to the world <laughs> and we're kind of finishing a uh, nine-month festival run and preparing for our release. We released theatrically in Estonia uh, just two weeks ago or three uh -huh. weeks ago, uh, which was amazing because the film got the wide release in all multiplexes in Estonia and, uh, and very, I think, good feedback and it was it was really nice to see that it crossed over and you know majority of the audiences were kind of usual cinema goers and people who i think would most uh, appreciate and benefit from seeing this experience yeah, from a different perspective to life and the same now we are preparing for our uk and uh, german releases which will be in cinemas at the end of february Mm. And then uh, I guess <coughs> North America, I would assume sometime around April or so, uh, March, April. So it's till May, I think, we'll be <laughs> on the next tour promoting the film and, you know, as the film opens, traveling to different countries to really uh, give more Q&As and uh, interviews and and share and, and hope that, uh, that people will uh, love it and will also uh, uh, tell their friends. So. Mm. Yeah, and given the, I mean, every every review I've read has, or most of the reviews I like, they're just glowing. So like, uh, I'm happy that people are seeing what I see in it. So uh, thank you so much uh, for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, I guess we're gonna sign off now. In the, uh, and uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you.